Good evening, good evening, everyone. Shout out Facebook, shout out YouTube. Thank you for jumping on the stream tonight. Trust that everyone has had a fantastic afternoon, evening. And uh, with that being said, we're going to get right into it. We won't be long tonight. I just want to touch on a few things that perhaps we have not thought about. Before we get started, do some little housekeeping. As you come into the building, hit that subscribe button, hit the share button so we can keep the uh, content coming to you. And thank you for all of my loyal supporters on Facebook and YouTube. Shout out to all my new subscribers on YouTube. And shout out to all of you who can have continued to be faithful with me all throughout 2022. Now we're in 2023 and I want to continue bringing you content more frequently than I've been allowed to <laughs> lately. I do appreciate your patience and uh, absolutely appreciate your support. Absolutely. Shout out to Macadine University. Shout out to Macadine University. For those of you that are not familiar with Macadine University, go get that book, go cop that book. I put it on the, uh, I put it in my Facebook page for you guys to check out. It's available on Amazon. Very informative book in particular for young men, for men in general. Go check that book out, Macadine University. And with that being said, let's get started, man. Let's get started. We want to find out who Mrs. Serlin J. Davis truly is. To all my uh, moderators, if you can hear my voice clearly in the in the uh, chat room, put a one in the chat room if you can hear me clearly. Thank you, thank you. Shout out to Quan. Shout out to Camille Shabazz. That's the brother who is the author of uh, Macadine University, guys. Check that book out for all the men that are in my group and for all the men who watch me and are, are subscribed to me on YouTube. Go check that book out. This is a must read. It's available again on Amazon. The author. Uh, the author is a very close friend of mine. I've been known for many, many years. Wonderful brother, Mr. Camille Shabazz. Check that book out. Let's get right into it, man. We want to find out exactly who Mrs. <laughs> Serlin J. Davis truly is, you know, because a lot of times black folk, we get bamboozled. I mean, when I tell you we get bamboozled, we get bamboozled. It's really easy to bamboozle us, it seems. I mean, all we got to do is put a black face in front of something, man, and we lose it. Uh, we think we have arrived somehow. We have arrived. But I'll tell you something. Um, understand something when you walk downtown and you look in the department stores you see windows right and you see things behind the window understand that's window dressing window dressing does not necessarily indicate what's inside the store how many times have you seen what was in the window and you went in to purchase it and it was unavailable so window dressing is to just get your attention doesn't necessarily mean the uh, what you see in the window is available inside the store Likewise, when we see a black face in front of uh, in front of us, no matter what that position is, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're for us. You know, uh, I'm a firm believer. I used to be this kind of guy that sat around looking at everybody black and saying, you know, that's my brother. That's my brother. I've learned to think a little differently since then. And I'll tell you something. Everybody black ain't your brother and everybody that's black. That's a female is not your sister. Understand it's relative. It is relative. Uh, what are you doing for your community who shares your reflection? What are you doing for your community that shares your reflection outside of running your mouth? Because this is what we hear most of the time. We find them. We find eloquent words, really fancy, sophisticated sounding words. But uh, a lot of times it lacks the substance. And uh, in most cases, we lack the results that we so desperately seek. When we see a black individual who shares our reflection, male or female, we find that they placate, cow tie. You know, they're in bed with those who don't have our interest at heart. 
So uh, we want to look at a history. This is how you really find out about a person. What is your background? What are you? What have you been involved in in the past? Not what you sound like today. Um, we got bamboozled with Obama. We got bamboozled with the new vice president. Um, but we don't know their past. We certainly don't understand their past and how it related to the black community. And if we dig deep enough, we'll find that uh, very little was done as it related to us. Now you say, well, Charles, why is that an important thing to talk about? Why is that important? Well, I will ask you, why isn't it important to you? Not so much why is it important to me? Why is it, why is it not important to you? Would be the better question. So we're going to get into it and talk about a little bit of her history, where she came from, and we can get a clear understanding as to exactly what her uh, what her real idea and motive was. You know, because I'm a firm believer also that how you do anything is how you do everything. So. Uh, yeah, you, I doubt you can change spots. You can change uh, your spots so quickly. So we're going to get into it. Hope everyone is doing well. And uh, again, you've had a fantastic afternoon. Hopefully you've enjoyed your weekend. You've had a productive weekend this weekend. And uh, in spite of the fact that we had some really cold weather this weekend, uh, looks like we got a little break today. The weather seemed to have broken just a little bit. <laughs> Even though it was in the 50s, it felt like it was almost spring. It goes to show you how the body uh, acclimates to the weather conditions. So, uh, yeah, so we had a pretty good day today. So let's get right into it. Let me see. I want to get some shout-outs. Shout-out to Khalid. Love you, man. Thank you for getting on the stream tonight. Shout-out to Gail. Shout-out to Abdul. Appreciate you. Shout out to Wayne, Dwayne Bowen. Shout out to Lynn. Shout out to all of you who consistently and have consistently supported this group and who have supported what I've been doing over the last eight to nine months. I truly appreciate your support. None of this could happen without you. So your, your support is certainly appreciated. All right. Now let's see. Who is Sarah Lynn J. Davis? Let's see who the sister is. I'm sharing my screen, so if you can see it, we're going to get into her first early years of her career. This is coming from, obviously, Wikipedia. Serlin C.J. Davis, born 1959, is an African-American police officer who is the 13th chief of police for the Memphis Police Department. Davis is Memphis Police Department's first black female chief. You know, it's the funny thing. We love to hear that first part, right? Every time we find out we're the first at anything, we get excited, man. <laughs> we get we get totally excited when we find out we're the first to do anything, you know. Um, sadly, sadly enough, uh, even though we end up being the first to do something, we tend to always disrespect the foundation we stand on. You know, there was a lot of lives lost in the struggle for what we know as civil rights, for what we know as equal rights or human rights, of which all three we are still yet struggling to get, even though some of us believe we've already gotten it. But for the sake of conversation, there's been many struggles and there's many, been many lives lost, many sacrifices made, uh, many families have lost their loved ones as a result of these three struggles, civil rights, human rights. And uh, to find ourselves now in 2023 with a lot of first black people who are involved in different positions, high level positions in politics, law enforcement, etc. And these positions have not given us any real results any real foundational results as it relates to a community in general. And I know some of us want to be in this kind of melting pot situation. We have never been in a melting pot since we've been here. The only thing that's been melted down is us as a people. So to say we're in a melting pot is really a delusional statement. 
And uh, I will tell you, in 2023, we are extremely delusional if we still think that we're in some kind of melting pot because we have celebrities who are successful in music, because we have celebrities who are black who are successful in uh, media, in terms of movies and theater. These accomplishments do not indicate the success of an entire nation of people who have been here for hundreds of years. And, you know, hundreds of years. It doesn't indicate success for an entire nation of people. The success of one is not the success of an entire nation. You know, and likewise, the attitude tends to trickle down. When we say, and you've heard me say in other streams, an injustice for one is an injustice for all, all of us. We, got, we have to get out of the mindset of thinking as an individual. Because thinking as an individual gets you nowhere. It gets you no success. We're the only group of people in this country in particular that think as an individual, thinking we are successful as a result of that thinking. And it's really sad because no other nation thinks that way. Now, we have a lot of dynamics involved that have caused us to think that way, and we can go into that, but that's a whole entirely different stream. But I will tell you this, that individual thinking, based on our successes, our individual successes, does not and has not ever indicated anything. We have been pacified. And I hope today, in 2023, we refuse to be pacified by anything. I don't want no damn street named after us, after you kill one of us. No, nah, keep your street. Keep your street. Because the street you name after one of our greats or after some celebrity that we admired who may have uh, shared our reflection does not indicate any kind of justice. Those are called pacifiers. You know, when a baby cries, he wants something other than what you put in his mouth, known as a pacifier. He really wants food or he wants to be held. He wants something real. But to quiet the noise, you give him a pacifier. <laughs> And, you know, sadly enough, black folk, we have become satisfied with pacifiers, you know. Um, in this particular case, we have five black men who were not only fired, but charged and incarcerated all in less than 20 days. It is the fastest conviction, fastest termination. It has been the fastest movement of what we are character what's characterized as justice as it relates to an injustice done to us that has been done in over 50 years. We have not seen anything like this. And I will tell you, it sets the precedence that in the future and we know it's going to happen again. We know huh, those of us that are from this country and we are black, you know that this is going to happen again. So, when it does, we're going to demand the same kind of fast movement in terms of getting the justice and the incarceration. But we want to see it done if it's done at the hands of white officers. Yeah, this is what we want to see. See, to do it so quickly with black men, not that they don't deserve to be incarcerated, no doubt. They deserve everything they're getting. In, in fact, <laughs> uh, they deserve worse. And I can't say it on... Uh, public media but you get the point um they deserve everything they're getting i don't have any pity on these anim on these knuckleheads i don't have any pity whatsoever at all you know but i'll tell you um there were others involved there were others involved we're talking upwards of at least seven to eight officers that were involved who did not share our reflection why have their names been so slow to be revealed why if only why has only one been revealed one little pillsbury doughboy has been revealed yeah only one and uh he has not been brought up on any charges he's been fired from his job yeah but why has he only been terminated why has no charges been brought up against him we're gonna get right into it but first let's let's delve into the leadership of this uh proposed 
sus uh, suspension team known as the Scorpion Task Force suppression team. Let's 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 delve into the leadership of this. Her name is Mrs. Serlin C.J. Davis. Again, born 1959. She's an American officer, police officer, African-American, 13th chief of police for the Memphis Police Department. She's the first black female chief. What is her early life and education? Davis was born in Fort Bragg into a military family. Davis has a degree in criminal justice from St. Leo University, graduating in 1998. After starting her studies at Georgia Military College and a master's degree, public administration from Central Michigan University. This is how her career spiraled. Davis joined the Atlanta Police Department in 1986. She was demoted, then fired from the Atlanta Police Department in 2008 for an alleged involvement in a sex crimes investigation into the husband of an Atlanta police sergeant, according to the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. She was reinstated following an appeal process that same year. Oprah Magazine identified Davis as one of 80 women forming the O White House Leadership Project. Women rule. <laughs> I'm not surprised. Davis became a deputy chief of the Atlanta Police Department in 2016, became chief of the Durham Police Department in North Carolina. Davis has served as president of the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives. In 2020, Davis appeared on Good Morning America, where she called for sweeping changes and police reform following the murder of George Floyd. Isn't that ironic? In 2020, it reads that she called for a sweeping change in police reform, yet she did nothing to reform the uh, gangland type suppression unit or task force known as Scorpion of which she headed. Where was the police reform then, Mrs. Davis? Where was the police reform then? Especially since many victims of this Scorpion task force that you lead, that you led, came forward since the death of Tyree Nichols and stated how they were beaten, pulled over, guns put to their head for no apparent reason whatsoever. These were thugs running around with badges on. Now, we all, we all are accustomed to thugs running around with badges on because that's our history in this country. So we're not surprised. But what makes this more surprising and more upsetting is the fact that these individuals shared our reflection. Oh, yeah, but nonetheless, they were, in fact, thugs. But she led these thugs. I'm certain there were police reports of abuse prior or before the death of Mr. Tyree Nichols. I'm certain that she got complaints from the public about being abused or unnecessary due force, unjustified force from the police department, from this particular task force. I'm certain that she got complaints from the public that she was supposed to serve. Funny how when this all took place, when she got before the camera, she seemed so surprised. Oh, I didn't understand what the purpose of them pulling him over was. I searched the video backwards and forward and couldn't find any indication as to why they pulled this uh, young man over. I just couldn't figure it out. She seemed so surprised. Well, guess what? We don't buy it. We don't buy it, Miss Davis. We don't buy it at all. But she she claimed to be so surprised. And many of you that saw her interview, I'm, I'm certain that you heard her when she said that. Okay, so what else did she go on to do after appearing on Good Morning America and calling for sweeping changes in police reform? She followed that by, uh, she followed that by being sworn in as the Memphis police chief in 2021. Davis again is the Memphis Police Department's first black female chief. She is also the first female chief of Memphis, Tennessee. In January of 2023, Davis described the killing of Tyree Nichols as a defining moment. Really? What was more defining, George Floyd or Tyree Nichols? 
See how see how the lines get blurred when you're about to lie. You say what's necessary to be said in front of the cameras. She said it was a defining moment. Defining what? In the Memphis Police Department's history, really. When the Memphis Police Department has a long history of abusing black men and women in that state. What exactly was being defined, Miss Davis? What exactly? She terminated the employment of five officers associated with Nichols' death. What is her personal life? Davis is married and has one daughter and two grandchildren. Now that we've gotten that part out of the way, let's get into her background. Has Mrs. Davis ever been associated with a suppression team? Oh, I'm glad you asked because absolutely she has. It says here, and this is coming from ABC News, Memphis police chief once led the aggressive Red Dog anti-crime unit in Atlanta. Critics say Serlin C.J. Davis should have known the risks of specialized street forces before she created the Scorpion unit, whose members were charged in Tyree Nichols' fatal beating. But yet she was surprised. You notice that. <laughs> it's funny how surprised they are when now... The questions arrive at their table. She has to put on a nice face. And she has to also get a scripted statement. Not a genuine statement. Understand that. A scripted statement. Because she has writers and people that tell her what and how to say a thing. How to spin a narrative. How to spin a narrative. It says, as she rose through the ranks of the Atlanta Police Department, Cyril and C.J. Davis spent nearly 18 months overseeing a hyper-aggressive street crime unit named Red Dog. That was um, ultimately disbanded following a public backlash and a series of lawsuits. Now look at that. Let's, let's, let's stop right there. <laughs> oh, but see, again, she was surprised. Remember that, folks. If you saw her interview... You heard her expressing how surprised she was as if, oh, my God, I've never seen nothing like this before in my life and all the years of my career as a law enforcement officer. Yeah. OK. All right. See, if you keep peeling away the layers, you'll find out the BS. As she rose through the ranks of Atlanta Police Department, Cyril and C.J. Davis spent nearly 18 months overseeing a hyper aggressive street crime unit named Red Dog that was ultimately disbanded. So she's no she's well known about disbanding uh, suppression uh, units. This is no this is no uh, sh she's been around a block a few times with getting uh, her units disbanded. OK, now in the wake of Tyree Nichols Davis faces questions over why she would launch a similar team in Memphis, Tennessee, called the Scorpion Unit shortly after she arrived to lead the city's police force in 2021. Now, I'm going to tell you something, folks, for those of us. For those of us that are black, every community we live in, there is a suppression unit. There's a suppression unit. I've never seen a city we lived in that didn't have one. And they're all, they all have these nice sounding names. It may sound like a bad name when you say Scorpion, but it, if you, if, uh, I hope I can find the actual meaning of that as we go on, as we continue to read further. But the name in, in and of itself is always a name that sounds good. It turns out the name of the actual suppression unit becomes an acronym for something else. So it's always couched as something that's good when in fact these officers are giving a silent whisper of immunity to their behavior. Do what you have to do. Get out there. Put the pressure on them. What exactly does that mean? And it goes undefined. So they go out there and define it however they believe it means. And usually it turns out to be defined as abusing the citizens in that area. Whether they're guilty or whether they're not guilty. If it's about stopping crime, how is it okay for you to become the same criminal that you're trying to stop? How does that work? How does that work? But see, the culture in law enforcement, the culture, I don't care what state, I don't care what city, I don't care where you are. 
the culture of law enforcement is not to serve and protect. And you've heard me mention this before in other streams. That is not the culture of law enforcement. Just in case you think that what's written on the side of that police car is actually what they believe, that's bull. They don't believe one single word of it. It doesn't mean to serve and protect. It means to serve their own interests and protect their own ass when they find themselves guilty of violating your civil rights, your human rights. You, the taxpayer, who pays for the same bullets that shoot you, who pays for the same guns that shoot you, and who pay for the same bulletproof vests that protect their lives from bullets, yet you have no bulletproof vest to protect you when they decide to shoot you. That's what your taxpayers, your, your tax dollars pay for. So serve and protect who is the real question. It says, uh, if anyone in Memphis had checked with anyone from the world of police oversight in Atlanta, they would have learned that creating a red dog like squad using red dog like tactics was inevitably going to result in police misconduct and violence, said Dan Grossman, an Atlanta lawyer who filed several successful lawsuits on behalf of victims alleging they were roughed up by Red Dog officers. Nichols, 29, was savagely beaten by members of the Scorpion unit during a January 7th traffic stop. And uh, they need to stop saying traffic stop because it wasn't no damn traffic stop. They need to stop that. It was no traffic stop. That was an ambush. Any of us that saw that video, that wasn't no damn traffic stop. That was an ambush. He was never he was never asked like a typical traffic stop. Let me see your license and registration. They never asked him for his license and registration. When they boxed him off, they snatched him out of the window. They didn't even open the door. They snatched him straight from the window, straight to the ground and commenced to beating on this man so that wasn't a traffic stop they really need to stop saying that he died three days later uh in my personal opinion he died that night on the scene five officers have been charged with murder davis arrived in memphis as a trailblazer the first woman to lead the police force in this majority black city and a vocal advocate for police reform who had testified before the U.S. Senate. Her actions in the wake of Nichols' death, which included swiftly firing the five officers, initially drew praise. Right. That's the initial shock because we're not used to getting justice that quickly. But she now faces increasing scrutiny over not just the decision to launch the Scorpion unit in Memphis, but also her earlier career in Atlanta where she supervised the disgraced Red Dog unit in 2006 and 2007. The unit had about 30 officers and a mission to flood areas of high crime in Atlanta with overwhelming force patrolling in groups of four or five. The officers were notorious for ambushing young men. Oh, there's that word I just used, right? For ambushing young men, yanking down their pants in public and performing full body cavity searches and a hunt for drugs in an attempt to spread fear, according to a review of lawsuits. Police officer affidavits and civilian review board memos, as well as interviews with plaintiffs, lawyers, and former Atlanta police oversight officials. Members of Red Dog were told, just get the job done. By whatever means, Stallone Davis, who joined the Red Dog unit around 2007, said in a 2012 court affidavit, he declined the comment for this article. Over the years, Atlanta settled at least 10 lawsuits related to Red Dog unit misconduct, costing taxpayers more than $2 million settlements, according to an NBC News review. None of the lawsuits alleged misconduct. Ain't, isn't that something? None of the lawsuits alleged misconduct that occurred during the time of C.J. Davis oversaw the unit. Wow, she insulated herself. Ain't that something? Some longtime Atlanta residents said the Red Dog officers were using unrestrained tactics before, during, and after her tenure. 
there was never a time that the Red Dog didn't operate the way the Red Dog have always operated, said Gerald Griggs, a civil rights attorney raised in Atlanta, who is now the president of the NAACP Atlanta's chapter. The unit was disbanded in 2011. Davis was still with the department, working as a community policing project manager, according to her resume. The Memphis Police Department's Scorpion team, which had a similar mission to that of Atlanta's Red Dog unit, drew similar complaints of excessive force and ultimately suffered the same fate. Davis shut Scorpion down last weekend. Now, I will tell you this, folks. She shut it, she shut it down, but it wasn't her decision. Oh, she wasn't. She had no intentions on shutting the Scorpion uh, suppression unit down after Mr. Nichols lost his life at the hands of these thugs. No, she had no intentions on shutting that suppression unit down. It was at the it was at the behest of the family of Mr. Tyree Nichols. Community intervention. Their lawyers. And many other individuals who had become victim to that same suppression unit. This is the pressure that caused her to disband the Scorpion suppression unit. She would have never done it. She had no intentions on doing it. Christina Bumud, the executive director of the Atlanta, C Atlanta Citizen Review Board from 2008 to 2011 said, it should have been clear to Davis that a tactical unit like Scorpion was prone to violating people's rights in Memphis, just as Red Dog did in Atlanta. Bumud said the board's investigators found that Red Dog officers regularly conducted police, pub police and public strip searches at least as far back as 2007 when Davis was overseeing the unit. She knows what can go wrong, Bumud said. Everybody who is a student of policing in the U.S. knows what can go wrong. And folks, they always know what can go wrong. The question is, do they care? And I'm a firm believer that in most cases, because of the culture of law enforcement, because of the culture and the mindset of public policing, which has never, ever been focused at serving nor protecting the general public that they're supposed to be serving, nor have they ever cared that things could go wrong. Because you know what? Things always seem to go wrong in our community they always seem to go wrong and uh those that commit these wrongs always seem to get an alibi always seem to get a pass always seem to have a reason that would justify violating the rights of the general public that they are sworn to serve so yeah they always know what can go wrong since the 1980s police departments across the country have launched street crime units in response to concerns about drugs and violence many were disbanded after they drew concerns about excessive force and contributed to a loss of public trust but some cities under pressure to deal with new crime spikes have formed new street units in recent years in memphis Davis must now steer a police department in crisis under an intense spotlight as a fierce debate grips the city over whether she is the right person to tackle an entrenched violent crime problem and address deep concerns about the police force's culture and tactics. She needs to do more if she wants to keep her job, Memphis City Council member J.B. Smiley Jr. said. She has to write the ship. Yeah, because the ship is off course. Davis, the Memphis Police Department, the Atlanta Police Department did not respond to requests for comments. Atlanta Red Dog Blitz. Davis' law enforcement career began in Atlanta where she started as a patrol officer in 1986. She was one of only two women to graduate from the academy that year, according to a profile in the alumni magazine of her alma mater. St. Leo University in Central Florida. Davis advanced through the ranks, landing the role of Special Operations Section Commander in June 2006. According to her resume, in that position, she oversaw several units, including SWAT and narcotics, 
in addition to the Red Dog team, according to her Memphis police bio. While the Red Dog unit's heavy-handed tactics would become a focus of scrutiny later, the real crisis of her tenure centered on the narcotics squad. In November of 2006, three officers fatally shot a 92-year-old woman in a botched drug raid, setting off protests and calls for police reforms. The family of the woman, Katherine Johnson, filed a lawsuit against the city, which was settled for $4.9 million. Davis was named in the lawsuit along with other police officials who were collectively accused of engaging in a pattern and practice of ignoring and violating the rights of the citizens of Georgia, which led to Johnson's killing. Now, let's stop right there. How in the hell did she get the job as chief of police in Memphis, Tennessee, with this kind of sketchy background as a deputy chief in Atlanta? She was the deputy chief of police in Atlanta. How did she get the job? Makes you scratch your head a little bit. And what was so pressing that they felt the need to get a black woman, promote her to the position of chief of police in, in Memphis, Tennessee, predominantly black community, with a sketchy background? I'm glad you asked, because they saw that she had no real concern about the civil rights or human rights of the people who shared her reflection in the city she had come from. They knew she was a she was a team player. <laughs> they knew she was a team player. Let's promote this one. Let's promote this one. You know, you got to realize something, folks. It's not always who you vote for. Some people are simply selected. And uh, I believe this uh, young lady was selected for the city of Memphis because they knew she was a team player. They watched her background. They looked at her background. You know they did. You know they knew where she came from. You know they knew her background in terms of her position in Atlanta. Heading up the Red Dog Unit, Suppression Unit, and the complaints and the civil rights violations and human rights violations that were inflicted upon the people in those communities who were predominantly black. Oh, she was the perfect candidate to promote in a predominantly black area of Memphis, Tennessee. I hope these pieces are coming together for you as you hear this. Let's continue. The city responded on behalf of Davis and the other high ranking officials saying they were protected by qualified immunity, a federal doctrine that shields officers from lawsuits related to their conduct. The incident led to an overhaul of the drug unit after prosecutors said officers had regularly lied to obtain search warrants and planted drugs at crime scenes. The Red Dog unit did not become the subject of lawsuits until years later. The unit whose name was drawn from the Red Dog Blitz, the play in football when several defensive players rush the quarterback, was formed in 1989. Its mission was to provide a high profile and aggressive police presence in areas of the city again that had high incidents of street drug sales, drug use, drug related violent crimes, According to a 2011 report by the city's law department that cited a, pol a police policy document, the Red Dog unit was disbanded in 2011 after the city agreed to pay more than $1 million and settle a federal lawsuit alleging that its officers used excessive force in 2009 raid at a gay bar, the Atlanta Eagle. Investigators found that officers barged in wearing black fatigues and shouted anti-gay slurs and threw patrons to the floor and handcuffed them while they ran background checks for criminal histories. The city erg argued that the officers had acted properly and had not violated the accuser's rights. <laughs> After the unit was shuttered, several other men came forward to accuse Red Dog members of having performed illegal searches. Ricky J. Sampson recalls at least three encounters with Red Dog Unit, one around 2005 when he said officers pointed guns at him and his brother and searched his car, one in 2006 which he said he was beaten beside his car, and another in 2010 in which he said he was strip-searched outside a shopping mall, leaving him shaken and scared. 
He later sued over the 2010 strip search, which the cited denied happened. The case was settled for $150,000. Sampson 38 said he knew the Red Dog unit growing up by the kind of car its members drove, a blue cruiser marked as police, but with no lights. <laughs> the tactical clothing they wore and how they traveled for in a car. He did not have any other way to identify them. I just know what the red dog is, he said. His lawyers were, however, able to link offices in 2000 trim 10 strip search to red dog unit. The red dogs changed my whole experience with police and made me really kind of cautious and nervous of them. Samson said in the interview this week, I don't trust them. When they snatch you, they pull your pants down and search you. It messes with you. You have no rights. We get the point, folks. We get the point. So now we want to go into uh, now we want to go into talking about um, Mrs. Cyril and C.J. Davis again, and the details of what got her caught up in this situation in. Uh, in Atlanta Memphis police chief this is coming from an article entitled the Daily Mail dailymail.com it says Memphis police chief tasked with investigating Tyree Nichols murder was fired from previous job with Atlanta PD over child porn scandal as protest turns ugly in LA now why is all this information really important? I, I, I hope you understand that this information is, is, is clearly important because it needs to be an eye opener for us. That when these kind of tragedies take place in our community where we are concerned. We suffered the injustice and the unjust murder of Breonna Taylor. We suffered the unjust murder and sweeping under the rug of the death of Trayvon. We've suffered the unjust conviction. Well, I won't say unjust conviction. It was, un it was just. But they always leave pieces out. George Floyd. There were many officers involved in the death of George Floyd. Many. And there were many of whom did not get convicted, but yet played a major role. But they focused on that one individual, that one cop that had his knee on his neck. And we can continue on and on and on about these kind of situations that have taken place in our community. And we can also clearly see that they always find a way to cherry pick as to who they're going to use as the sacrificial lamb. When in reality, there are many that walk away free. I'll tell you something. Unfortunately, law enforcement is littered and has been fully infiltrated by white supremacists. That's just simply a reality. That's just simply a reality. You know, they don't walk around in white sheets anymore with hoods. You know, they don't do that anymore. Riding around on horses, you know, with crosses that are burning. They don't do that anymore. That's old school. Now they do it in a suit. Now they do it in a police uniform. Now it's your dentist. Now it's your gynecologist. Now it's the nurse that serves you in the hospital. Now it's the doctor at your bedside. Yeah. Now it's the now it's the people that you don't suspect that hold these same attitudes and ideas and ideals. That's why when it happens, we seem to be so shocked as a community. That's why we never really truly know how to respond. And I'll tell you, responding by burning your own community down has never been the solution it's never worked though I understand it though I understand it 
it's uh it's never been a productive response what would be i believe a more productive response to situations like this is if we learn to realize that for us to be unified is not at the expense of any nationality but it's to our own benefit to be unified not not at the expense of anyone else and don't make anyone make you feel guilty at wanting to unite with your own everybody unites with their own everybody nature unites with its own you don't see a blue jay with a robin you don't see a black ant with a red ant they all know their place but they don't unite at the expense of the other species it's just the way nature made it it's not a problem and funny enough black folk have been made to believe that to unite with ourselves and think for ourselves as a nation of people that somehow is to neg is to the negate or the negation of some other nationality which is absolutely ridiculous absolutely ridiculous absolutely ridiculous and this is why when things like this happens we don't know how to properly respond because we always think we're going to hurt someone's feelings by being united with ourselves and this is this is sad that we have been brought to this kind of mindset you know so is this going to happen again oh yeah it's going to happen again it's going to happen again because see one thing we we always fail to realize is that tyree nichols is is your son that's your son for those of you that are listening if you have sons that's your son for those of you that are listening that's your nephew that's your grandson that's you that's me I drive every day to and from work I could be pulled over the same way my sons drive to and fro from their jobs their place of employment they can be pulled over for a quote-unquote routine traffic stop yeah right but they too, in fact, can be a victim of the same thing that Mr. Tyree Nichols was a victim of. I can be a victim of the same thing Tyree Nichols was a victim of. And you uh, that are listening can be a victim of the same thing that Tyree Nichols was a victim of. None of us are in control of whether that happens or not. Understand that. But what makes it much more gives much more clarity to it is if we're awake and alert to the fact that it can happen and then begin to unite with one another as a people so that when things like this do happen we're not so quick to take the pacifier we're not so quick to jump up and scream victory without seeing all of the players involved take accountability for their for their part that they played and i think that's where the that's, i think that's where we drop the ball at in a lot of cases we drop the ball there you know and uh it's amazing that i mean you you would think that we would be truly sick and tired of these kind of uh, stories i know we say we're sick and tired i know we say we're sick and tired but why do I use the example of a pacifier? Because we're sick and tired until the pacifier is put in our mouth. Then after it's put in our mouth, we stop crying. Only to find later that true justice has never been served. And that we in fact have been sucking on a pacifier. And that's not true justice. True justice is not the conviction of five. True justice is the conviction of all who were involved. If you drive your quote unquote so called friend to a bank, and that so called friend, whether you were aware or not, goes into that bank 
with you under the impression that they're going in to uh, withdraw some money from an account they say they have at that bank. I want you to think. If they go inside the bank to withdraw money from an account that they say they have and you believe them. And in fact, while you're in front of the bank waiting for them to come back out. They go in and rob the bank. And as a result of that robbery, someone loses their life. Guess who's going to jail with them? You. You are, con you are considered an accessory after the fact. Because you were there. You provided the transportation. And as far as the law is concerned, had you not provided the transportation, the robbery and the subsequent death would have never taken place. So you and that individual face robbery, armed robbery, potentially, and murder charges. So you tell me, where's real justice with five when there were many other players involved? And Mrs. Sarah Lynn C.J. Davis, she knows that. She's a law enforcement officer. She knows that. She knows that. Folks, understand when you're being pinned up against the ropes. Understand when you're being pinned up against the ropes with a narrative that they want you to believe in. She knows that. But yet there are other individuals who escape conviction. Oh, yeah, they may have lost their job. So what? So what? They get to go back to their families. And tell their story over dinner. While five black men who deserve to be convicted, no doubt. Go to prison alone. Where are the rest of the players, Mrs. Davis? See, these individuals who, who sit in positions of, of authority, no matter what that position is, time is over in coming before us, smiling, grinning with some pre-written speech about how shocked you are because we're not buying it. Where are the rest of the players, Mrs. Davis? Where are the rest of the players? Because until you produce the rest of the players to face the same justice that they deserve in being uh, a part of the death or the beating that led to the death of Mr. Tyree Nichols, then you're not going to smooth us over and pacify us with the five when we know there were more players. Miss Davis. Truth be told, she needs to step down from her position. Because she's not worth a damn in the position anyway, regardless of whether she's black or not. That's a fact. Black folk are way past, I would hope that we are, way past, getting all warm and fuzzy. When we see a black person in a position of power as though it means something where we are concerned as a community, it means nothing. It means absolutely nothing. Window dressing. Remember, we can see that she has a history in law enforcement with these suppression units. We can also see the unsuccessful implementation of these suppression units that she led all of which have been disbanded, all of which have a sketchy background, all of which have been guilty of violating the civil rights, human rights of black men and women in every community that she's served in leadership in. What makes her different in Memphis, Tennessee? What makes her different? Absolutely nothing makes her different. She's no different than if she was a white woman in that same position or a white man in that same position. The same damn thing happened. Imagine you as a black person being confronted by all, all black police officers 
and finding yourselves finding yourself fighting for your own life at the hands of those who share your own reflection can you imagine the feeling that could come over you in thinking that perhaps you might be safe in this situation because they share your reflection only to find that just in a few minutes you're fighting for your life at the hands of your own so-called brother or your own so-called sister law enforcement officer imagine that I can only imagine I can only imagine what Mr. Tyree Nichols was feeling at the moment where he knew he was not getting home that night. He was not going to get home that night. Yet he was only three blocks away from his home. Three blocks, approximately 80 yards away from his home. So close and yet so far. And yet so far. Really sad situation. Mrs. C.J. Serlin C.J. Davis. You are under the spotlight. You are under the spotlight. And personally, I don't think you can turn this thing around under your leadership. I don't think any leadership can turn this around unless they turn around the culture of law enforcement. And I don't believe they're going to turn around the culture of law enforcement. I really don't. I don't see it. I don't see it at all. Because this has been going on for way too long and for way too many years. And it has not changed. We get the same. And all we get is more and more of the same in terms of conversation. When they get before us, they play the general public of black men and women in this country like a bunch of fools. That's it. Play on your emotions. Say certain things to you to make you smile. And then they get these lawyers who I believe coach. Coach our loved ones into saying what they believe will bring the money. You say, well, why you say that, Charles? Glad you asked. Let's go back. Let's walk it back just a little bit. If you look at the what happened with uh if so for those of you that can remember it if you walk it back just several years back with Rodney King they beat him nearly to death for those of us that are old enough to remember that we watched it and it was videotaped it was recorded live and even after that those officers were protected. He got a little settlement ultimately. And what did he say when he had the opportunity to actually tell the truth? He got before the public and said, can't we all just get along? Hell no. We ain't never been able to just get along. Because every time we try to get along, these are the kind of things that happen. These are the kind of things that happen. And I find it extremely ironic that in the face of all of the violence that we face, regardless of what state, regardless of what city, regardless of what town we face, even under the threat of violence, and ultimately in some cases, in many cases, losing our life, we are told then, be peaceful. Well, guess what? That's nice. That's nice. But I would say this. Let's put pressure on law enforcement and everybody else that wants to violate the civil rights of black men and women in this country. You be damn peaceful. How about you be nonviolent? How about that? Stop telling peaceful people who are known to protest peacefully who are known to protest without violence. But in yet in spite of protesting nonviolently, in spite of protesting 
peacefully. Our nonviolent approach, our peaceful approach, is then violated with violence. Yeah, I think you need to take your own medicine and tell your damn self to be nonviolent and peaceful. And stop violating the rights, civil rights, human rights, and basic dignities of people of color in this country. Be it black, brown, or yellow. Stop violating those rights. And you'll get peace. Because you can't ask for peace where you refuse to be peaceful yourself. I mean, you can't have it both ways. You can't be violent and then ask for peace. That's ridiculous. You don't behave that way with other nations as a country. You don't behave that way. Soon as you feel like somebody's acting aggressively towards you, automatically we're at war. Where's your peace then? Where's your peaceful conversation then? Where's your nonviolent approach then? We've been dying since we've been in this damn country. At the hands of those that cared nothing about our life. And they did not share our reflection. And now we as a people have become our own worst enemy. So they, have, they start a slogan, Black Lives Matter. Why the hell should white folks uh, believe in black lives mattering when we as black people don't care about black lives mattering? It's just a slogan, a cliche. We really got to wake up. We really got to wake up, folks. You know, and uh, until we wake up, we can expect and we should expect not a decrease in things like this. No, nah, not a decrease. Oh, you should, in fact, expect an increase in things like this going forward until we wake up. This will happen again. Sadly, some young man, some young, some young woman somewhere who's living their life normally right now as I speak, they have no idea that their days are numbered because this will happen again. We have to wake up. We have to wake up and we have to stop being bamboozled. Because we see a person who shares our reflection and position of leadership who can just come and soft talk us to sleep. To where we now don't believe the reality of what we see right before our own eyes.